among the nations. Amen. You know, as a church, we're going through the book of Matthew. But to do an introduction today about moving mountains. Today's sermon is entitled Moving Mountains. Have you ever thought about how much a mountain might weigh? We got good old Camelback right behind us. It's majestic and beautiful. It's not, it's not Mount Everest, amen, but it's a mountain. It's billions of tons of earth and rock and sediment and so on, amen. It'd be no small task if we had to move that mountain like over to Popco Park or something, right? I mean, that would take a tremendous amount of resources and effort, right? But today we're going to talk about moving mountains. You ever heard this saying before? Seeing is... That's what they say, isn't it? I want to put before you that they don't know what they're talking about. So let's look at the Bible. Look in Hebrews chapter 11. Before we dive in here, we're going to go to Hebrews 11, and then we'll spend a little time in prayer together just to set our hearts and our minds in God's Word. So if I could ask you to bow your heads with me and let's pray. Father, I just want to ask you right now that you take me out of the way and that your Word, your Scriptures, your teaching, your Holy Spirit really instructs us this morning. That we are impacted in our hearts, that our faith is built, our understanding of faith is built, and that you, God, guide us right now. That we will have a faith that's greater because of our time in the scriptures this morning and the decisions that we make for transformation and really getting drawing near to you. Please, please, guide us, God. Guide us as we study the scriptures. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11. Moving mountains. Verse 1. Now faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what we do not see. Sure of what you hope for and certain of what you don't see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks, even though he's dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Sure of what you hope for, certain of what you do not see. What do you hope for this morning? There's all this hubbub, and it's really cool. There's all this hubbub about being able to image a black hole. M87 at the center of a distant galaxy. All this collaboration and all these different scientists. All the world. It's really actually really cool how they image the black hole and prove that these massive, extreme celestial bodies actually exist. Well, God created that. As cool as that is, we can finally see it. It just gives God glory. Because the universe was formed at God's command. There was nothing. God commanded it. There was this big bang, boom, universe. Amen? That's part of having faith. Realizing that God created this universe. And it is powerful what he's done. It's powerful what he's architected, engineered, and designed. Amen? And it says here that Abel gave a better sacrifice than Cain. Why? Because he gave with what? Faith. So when we make an offering, whether it be for missions or whatever, we got to have the same kind of thing that Abel did. Faith. And we also learned today we've got to have some love too. Amen? Thanks, Isaiah. Enoch pleased God. You ever thought about that? How do I please God? I can't say that I've always had that kind of thinking myself, right? How do I please God? What do I need to do to please God? Well, it starts with having faith. It starts with having faith. Enoch had faith, and God rewarded him because he sought God with all of his heart, and God rewarded him. God allowed him not to experience death. That's kind of cool. I mean, if you just kind of poofed one day. We're out out hanging out in fellowship, and we're all fired up, and all of a sudden, Tommy, like, poof. The Lord took him. Amen. Amen. 
<laughs> Don't get any wrong ideas, okay? But you know what I'm saying? It'd be pretty cool. That's what Enoch's life was. Because he had faith and he pleased God. Romans 10, 17. How do you, faith, okay, how do you, how do you get faith? How do, you, how do you build faith? I mean, what, what do we need to do to have faith? I want to please God. I assume you're at church today because you want to figure out how to please God because you want to fight for your faith. Maybe you don't have much of it. Maybe you're like, man, my faith is really small right now. I need to figure out how to build it. You ever felt like that? Your faith's kind of taking a beating? I can tell you right now that when, when, you know, a lot of things can sap our faith. We can get sick and then we get discouraged. That can sap our faith. Our spouse can get sick. That can sap our faith. Sorry, Amy, Amen. right? I know that we can, like, the circumstances can sap our faith. Sin, oh my goodness, that can sap our faith. Other people's sins, like our kids. I have a couple kids. When they sin, believe it or not, my kids are not perfect. Sometimes I feel like they are, but they're not. And when they sin, it can sap my faith. Okay, how do we build it? Romans 10, verse 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. We got, simply put, we got to get into our Bible. Now, it's interesting, because we can get into our Bible academically, right? I want to help you understand that faith is not just reading the Bible, and not just like reading it, just for the sake of reading it. There's more to it than that. Right? If you read your Bible, and then you're like, oh, how come I don't have any faith? I read my Bible today. Well, there's an ingredient that we got to grab a hold of. Hearing the word of God, the intention is you're going to listen to it. And listening has two pieces, okay? My, I have kids, so I can explain this better, right? My son, when I tell him, Dimitri, clean your room, he can look straight at me, nod and acknowledge that he heard it, and then go right back to what he was doing. Especially if it's like his favorite TV show or he's playing on his tablet or something, you know? Like, uh-huh, yeah, daddy, okay. Right back to where sometimes we can treat the word of God that way. Right? And we wonder why our faith isn't built because faith has a, it's, it's hearing the word of God and actually doing something with it. Take, take a look in James chapter 2. If we're going to move mountains, let's understand what, 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 what the rocket fuel is to do that from the Bible. James chapter 2. James 2, pick it up in verse 14. What good is it, James 2, 14, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds, has no deeds, can such faith save him? I mean, what's the obvious answer to that rhetorical question? Right, that's why they're asking it. They're posing the questions for you to go, no, that doesn't make any sense. Because you have your faith, like my son, he hears what I say, but he doesn't do anything with it. If we hear as God's children what he says, but don't do anything with it, can such a faith save us? No. No, it can't. That's the obvious answer. Suppose a brother or sister, this is verse 15, James 2. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go, wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. So we see that hearing the message, right, we actually got to listen to it, and listening has two pieces, right? It's hearing it. Yeah, I retained it. I understand it. Yes. But listening is actually listening, like doing it. Amen? So faith in the Bible, a saving faith, a vibrant living faith, is tied to action. Like, God wants us to be action heroes. Amen? Men and women of action, not academia. The purpose of us studying the Bible is to hear God's call out of the darkness and into a new life. It's to put action with our faith. So i got to ask you this. You, you just believe and that's good? You just, oh, I just believe I'm good. I believe in Jesus. I, I, you know, I believe the Bible. I'm good. I go to church once in a while. I'm good. Look at this passage. It gets very intense, right? Verse, verse 18, if somebody, someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith by, without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. You believe there's one God, do you? Do you believe there's one God, church? Amen. Even the demons believe that and shudder. 
That's James chapter 2, verse 19. So if belief was enough for salvation, then the demons are saved. Well, that don't make any sense theologically. What does that mean? You've got to have action with your faith. By definition, faith involves action, real biblical faith. So when you read the Bible, it should call you to action. You ever felt stuck before? I remember feeling stuck in my own life. I just felt like I couldn't change. I appreciate Maurice's openness. I went through a period of my life very similar to Maurice's openness where I struggled with my, my purity, and I was like stuck. I'm like, I can't change this. I don't know how to change this. I felt just enslaved. And I remember the brothers in my life teaching me how to talk about my thought life and my heart and how to be open because I didn't know how to do that. I had gotten used to putting on a show at church. And so I needed somebody to kind of help me open up, and I had to be willing to let them. And so they showed me scriptures about being open, about being transparent, about walking in the light. And I, and I had to, like, memorize them because my heart was just hard. But I remember the questions. I remember the challenges. And I remember when I finally started putting into practice what the Bible said, my faith started to grow. I started to believe that I could be freed from the chains. I started to believe that I could transform. And as that started happening, it gained more momentum. I got more and more open. I got deeper and deeper convictions about it. I got a lot of input. I got a lot of teaching, training, because I walked in the light. I got help. I needed, my fa- I needed my listening skills to be worked on, right? Like my son might need me to tell him a couple of times. I would remind him with some discipline. I needed to be here a few times and be reminded and challenged on it. And I thank God that I was, that somebody was patient with me and put up with my stubbornness. My, my own deceitfulness, my own hard-heartedness. And they paved the way for me to change. I'm not perfect, but there's been great change. So I could be in a position to lead Amy spiritually and marry her. And I'm so thankful for the time somebody put in to help me with my faith. Because I didn't believe I could change. Maybe you don't believe you could change this morning. That's a lie from hell. You can change. You can be different. You can transform. You can become something holy. You become something radiant. I was so encouraged to see Veroni get restored. The other day, we, 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 were, we were visiting. They were doing a Bible study with a friend, and I got to see, you know, Veronique and, and Nubian and their family. It's just a radiance in the house. There's a levity. There's a joy, right? And lyrics, I'm, I'm surrounded by disciples. Good for you. <laughs> Lord is hemming you in, okay? He's got good plans for you. But it's so encouraging to see people remember they don't have to be stuck. Like I remember when I saw Caleb get restored. I remember him saying, bro, how how he just felt, when he's coming out, he just felt stuck. He felt like, man, I messed up so bad. But how do I I get a faith? A little faith. Put some hope in there and some love. And the rest is history. It's amazing to see the transformations that God rots around us because yeah. people decide, I'm just going to have a little faith. And before you know it, mountains start moving. Amen. Amen. Look at Matthew 13. We'll look at a few passages and teachings from Jesus on faith together. Amen. Matthew 13. Now that we have a good idea what faith is, amen? Matthew 13, verse 54. Coming to his hometown, Jesus began teaching the people in the synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown and in his own house is a prophet without honor. And and, and he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Sometimes we have religious experiences in our life we have a religious background. Maybe we went to this church, that church, Bible school, or what have you, and we just figure we got it all sorted out. That we got Jesus sorted out. 
that we know where he fits and what box he fits in and how he works with our schedule. At the end of the day, we don't want to put Jesus in any kind of box. You know, I've been at this, this discipleship business for about 25 years now. Right, 27, actually. My wife just turned 25 spiritually earlier this, this couple weeks ago, man. You're a quarter of a century old spiritually. But she'll tell you, and I'll tell you, that the more you actually know, if you know anything, the less you actually realize, the less you know. Like, man, I really have a lot to learn. I can tell you right now, 27 years, I look back on the 27 years and I'm like thinking about the times that I first went into the ministry or that I, I think about the times when I was young in my marriage. I'm like, man, I thank God for the tremendous amount of mercy I was shown. And I look ahead and I'm thinking, I don't know where those mountains are going to lead us, but I know that we got to climb them together. And it's always a learning process. We never arrive. We're never Jesus or Jesus said or what have you, right? We got to constantly be learning, constantly deepening, learning more perspective and depth in our faith so we're better equipped for the battles ahead of us. We learn from the losses and, and victories behind us. We got to build a greater faith because if we lack faith, we won't see very many miracles. But I look around the room and I see miracles. I, I, I look around the room and I see miracles. There's probably a miracle sitting next to you. Right? I see miracles. Some miracles haven't happened yet, but I reckon I'll be faithful and see what happens. Amen? Let's decide today that if we're going to move mountains, we're going to build a greater faith. That's our first point, build a greater faith. Look at Matthew 8. Let's learn some more from Jesus about faith, shall we? Matthew chapter 8. Pick it up with me in verse 5. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant is, lies at home, paralyzed and in terrible suffering. Now, let me give you a little bit of background on what a centurion is, okay? You may not be super familiar with what a centurion is, right? How many pennies are in a dollar? And we call that a, a cent, right? Centurion is in charge of 100 people, okay? There's 100 cents in a dollar. See, we get the idea? Centurion, right? 100 centimeters in a meter, amen. Cent, centurion. Well, those are all like Greek and Latin-based terms, right? Okay, that's because this guy is not a Jew. This guy's a Roman because he's in charge of Roman soldiers. That's a Roman military organizational unit at Centurion. So he's a military leader of the same people, the Roman people, that conquered Jerusalem and Jesus' people. And if you know anything about ancient Romans, but in the first century, none of them were like really Christians or following Judaism or whatever. So this guy is really unusual. One, he's a military leader. Two, he's a foreigner of a foreign nation, right? And three, he's like humbling himself, looking to Jesus. What does this guy hope for? His servant to be healed, right? What is he certain of? More certain than his identity as a Roman. More certain than his Roman pagan religions or godlessness. What is he more certain of? That Jesus can fix it. And so he humbles himself and he comes to Jesus and asks, and he even addresses Jesus properly. Look what he says in verse 6. Lord. Now he's only supposed to call Caesar Lord here, guys. But he's humbling himself, saying, Lord, my servant's suffering. Can you help him? Jesus says in verse 7, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not even deserve to have you come under my roof. Look how humble this guy is. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that would come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, 
I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness. Will there be weeping, gnashing of teeth? Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it will be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very hour. He was certain that Jesus had the authority to do it. He's like, I'm, 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 I lead 100 guys. I tell this guy to do this. He does it. I come, go. They come, they go. People listen to me. And I'm just a man. But you're God in the flesh. So if you say it's going to get done, you don't have to, you don't, you don't even, I don't even deserve to have you come over to my, I'm so, I'm such a pagan. I'm so sinful. I'm so not a Jew, right? Jews had a law that forbid them to associate with Gentiles, guys. Jesus was clearly willing to cross that boundary, right? Yeah. This guy's, look, I'm not even worthy of it. Just, just, just say the word. What do you see here? A great faith. Why? He trusted Jesus's authority. He believed in Jesus's authority. And he trusted. So many times our, 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 our faith is, is hurt because we just don't trust. We, we have some bad church experiences. Or we have some bad personal experiences with relationships. Or we have some scar tissue in our marriage, in our, in our relationship. Maybe we've been abused or something, you know. And, and so it's hard for us to trust. Maybe we, 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 we've grown up in a race, race, racially charged environment. And it's hard for us to trust people of a different background or color. Maybe we're just afraid to get hurt again. So we don't trust. You see, you're focused on the wrong things. That centurion was focused on God, focused on Jesus. So he trusted. Matthew 15, still with me? Matthew 15, verse 21. Just going through Matthew, trying to understand faith, amen? There's a lot in here. I can't cover all of it today. Building a greater faith starts with having a greater trust, amen? I appreciate some of the examples I've heard. Isaiah explaining, look, my car broke down, but I still want to trust God and be sacrificial. I appreciate that. That's, that's exactly this principle, you know? I appreciate people are like, I don't know... If, what I want to do exactly with my career or my situation, but I'm going to trust God and I'm going to move to Sydney so I can help plant the Auckland, New Zealand church. And that's what our sister Monica Wilson did. Amen. I appreciate people who trust God, like, like our dear sister Brittany, Brittany Bullerin. Um, I, got a, I got a little message from uh, Dahlia, her mom, um, that has pictures that Kevin, her, her boyfriend, Kevin, in Toronto there, took of Brittany baptizing somebody today. Yeah. To God be the glory, amen. That's someone who'll go out on faith. I mean, and that Toronto mission team, right, there would be no such thing as a mission team unless all those people got together and went out on faith and trusted and God did something miraculous through it. That's how every single church starts. That's how this would start in 2005. Chris and Sonny Klopak were like, we got to get back to our core convictions of discipleship, commitment, and evangelizing the world. And they started this church in their living room. Their living room. And they persevered and they didn't quit. And, and they sacrificed. And, and, and he stepped out of working and stepped back in the ministry. It was super risky and hard for him. But they persevered because of trust and faith. And now there's a glorious church in Phoenix. And we get to be a part of it because somebody trusted and had faith. And that's incredible. That's how you build a greater faith. It starts with trust. Matthew 15, 21. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. That's horrible, right? Now, if you know anything about Canaanites, I don't know if you know anything about Canaanites. Anybody? I know a little bit about Canaanites, right? They're the descendants of Ham. N not the food, the person, okay? You're like, who's Ham? Well, you know, 
Ham is the, is, is, the, is the son of Noah who looked upon Noah's nakedness with no shame and disgraced his father in acting that way. And his other, you know, Shem and Japheth like covered up Ham, it covered up Noah's, you know, naked body with, with because Noah was, it's a long story, but basically Noah was in a bad way and they, they tried to cover him up. But, but Ham didn't care. And, and because of this, God like threw Ham he was cursed because of his disposition, and, he, and, and the people that came for him became enemies of God's people. The Canaanites are sworn enemies of Israel. They're invaders. They're, they're marauders, and they have their own kind of religion. They're the ones that kind of instituted Baal worship and the worship of Ashtoreth and these other pagan gods that involve like ritualistic immorality and some other really vile things. So the Canaanites are kind of, they're, they're, they're sketch, man. And they're violent, and they hate Israelites. And here's this woman who's a Canaanite coming up to Jesus. And everybody knows she's a Canaanite, probably because of her skin color, okay? Maybe there's some tats going on because they often would tattoo themselves to venerate the dead and their pagan gods. Hopefully that's not why you tattoo your amen. Amen, if you're here, you can repent, right? Because this Canaanite woman repented too. We'll get to that. So you, now you know who's talking to him, right? the kind of person, the racial tension that would be there, the religious tension that could be there, right? Plus, there's the gender gap. You, you with me so far? Yep. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is in terrible, suffering terribly from demon possession. Verse 23, De Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away. She keeps crying out after us. Get away from me, boy. You bother me. I mean, you can look at the situation and see Jesus not saying anything, not even answering her, and be like, okay, I mean, is the Lord being rude here? What's going on? Right? I mean, if we're in the fellowship, and somebody comes up to me and says, Jeremy, how you doing? Can we talk? And I ignore you. That'd be, you'd be like, man, what's up with you, bro? Are you okay? I mean, like one or two responses there. You kind of get more in my grill and go, bro, are you okay? Hello? What's up, man? Right? Or you might go talk to one of the brothers. You can grab one of the shepherds. Is Jeremy okay? He's like ignoring people. Right? But they're like, Lord, send her away. She keeps bothering us. She keeps bothering us. And remember, they're Jews, right? Jesus' followers are Jews. And so they're dealing with this woman who's from a pagan nation, a nation that's been at war with Israelites, and she keeps bothering them. And they're like, we're not going to do anything for you because of who you are and your background, and you're a woman, so just go. Get away. She's bothering us. You know, you can be tempted sometimes when Jesus doesn't answer the way that you want him to answer. Be tempted to give up. Be tempted to be like, fine, I'll just suffer. You don't care about me. See, you're not answering my prayers. You're not listening. You don't care. And we start casting our own bitter feelings on God, like somehow God feels the same way we do. Or we, can, we have a right to tell God how he's feeling, right? We can craft how God's feelings are, are supposed to be. Like, like we have that ability, right? But no one really knows what was going on in Jesus' head, okay? Who knows what he was really thinking? Was he thinking about these things? I don't know. He's Jesus. But I could see what he did. And I believe with all my heart that he was testing this woman to show us, to teach us something today about having a greater faith. Jesus did not answer a word, so his disciples, they urge him, right? Send her away. She keeps crying out. Verse 24, he finally answers here in verse 24. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Right? You see the whole racial issue? You see the whole religious issue? He's drawing the line there. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Wow. Say What? Now, wouldn't the temptation be right there to get ticked off? Yeah. What, who are you calling dog? What's up? Wouldn't that be the temptation? Like, are you serious? You calling me a Are you serious? My kid's demon possessed. I'm crying my eyes out, and you, what, what is going on? The temptation could be to lose trust. Look what she says in verse 27. Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Wow. 
Wow. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And, and her daughter was healed at that very hour. Imagine if she let her pride get in the way. Imagine if she didn't trust. If she didn't give Jesus, get this, guys, didn't give Jesus the benefit of the doubt. Because she decided to give him the benefit of the doubt, she answered with humility. And she said, you got great faith. You want to build great faith? Be humble. Just be humble. Just stay humble. It took humility. It was her humility that made her faith great. If we have hum humility, we're going to have great faith. I appreciate my brother Scott. He's, a, he's, 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 you know, he wouldn't tell you this. Scott would not tell you this, but he's, he's more humble than he comes across. You know? And I'll never forget that a few, few, a couple months ago, he was like, guys, let me just do communion. Let me just be open right now. He just starts talking about his life, where he's been sinning, where he's been struggling. He's just super vulnerable and humble with all of us as a family. I don't think it's any mistake that right after that, Judd and Mana became disciples and got like baptized and they got married. I don't, I don't think that's a mistake, Right? I, th I think God just, when we do stuff like that, God's like, okay, you get it. Let me bless you. Because you have great faith. And where there's faith, there's miracles. Amen. So if you're not seeing miracles in your life right now, try, try humility. Start there. And I guarantee you, God will do something amazing. God will transform you and, and, your, and your circumstance. Amen. Matthew chapter 9, building great faith. Matthew chapter 9, verse 1. Are you guys still with me? Yeah. Jesus stepped into a boat. Matthew 9, 1. Crossed over and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, take heart, your son, son your sins are forgiven. Now, just work with me here for a moment. I have to imagine this in my mind. You've got these four guys carrying their friend to Jesus. And their friend is paralyzed. Can you imagine what the dialogue must have been like? Hey, Johnny, me and the guys are going to take you to uh, this Jesus guy. What if I don't want to go? Well, what are you going to do? You're paralyzed, bro. We're just going to pick you up. <laughs> Another one of these, you know, quack guys going to try to do something, you know. I mean, what is this? No, no, man, we, we believe he can really help you. All you guys? Yeah, we think he can help you. Okay, okay. So they pick him up, and they're carrying him through the streets. What are you all doing? We're taking him to that Jesus guy. Oh, okay. What are you all doing? It's okay, they're helping me out. They're taking me to some Jesus. Yeah, Jesus of Nazareth, right, okay. This is awkward, Okay. Now, in another account, they actually had to lower him into the roof because there's too many people in the house. And that's even more awkward. For one, how they get him up there, right? Like, <laughs> well, you hold his back and I'll hold his legs and we'll like swing him up. <laughs> hey, guys, take it easy. I don't know. <laughs> but they managed to get him up there and they break a hole in the roof. It's like imagine Jesus sitting there and he's teaching and then all of a sudden like plaster and dirt falls down. I was like, what? And looks up, and sure enough, you know, they cut a hole in the roof, and it falls down, and there's smoke, and people are like, what? And, and the guy who owns the house is like, bro, that's my roof, brother. What are you <laughs> Good thing I don't have a pool. Anyway, so they lower him down, and, and they get him in front of Jesus, and a guy, the guy's paralyzed. So hello, the obvious thing, Captain, is to heal the guy. I mean, can we agree that that's the obvious inference? That they would not take their paralyzed friend all the way to this miraculous guy so they could hear, son, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> Say what? I mean, we just threw him up on the thing and all that. Is for, for, it's, you're, 
I mean, that, I'm sure they were stunned. And I bet the guy, I mean, I would think the paralyzed guy would be like, <laughs> okay. Okay. I mean, it's, that's cool, but, I, you know, all right. And, of course, there's always the naysayers, you know, the, the, the critics. Every crowd's got critics. Every crowd. And in verse 3, after they, everybody that's standing there hears them say, Son, your sins are forgiven. The teachers of the law there, right? Some of the teachers of the law, they say to who? Verse 3, themselves. They say to themselves, this fellow's blaspheming. So they don't say it out loud, right? It's not like it's, it's, it's said in a big group like this. It's not like, like if I said something blasphemous, the lamb stands up and goes, that's blasphemy. That's not what's going on. It's not a big public. It's more like in his mind, he's like, this is blasphemous. Maybe he leans over to the guy saying, and goes, isn't that just blasphemous? But nobody hears him. It's kind of between the two of them. You know what I'm saying? That's the vibe here, right? How do you know that? Well, let's keep reading, right? Knowing they're what? Verse 4? So clearly it's not something they vocalized. If Jesus knew their thoughts, guess what? He knows yours too. This morning. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Now this is public. Now Jesus is calling them out. Why do you entertain evil? I mean, it's awkward, right? <laughs> Lim's like, bro, just an example. You're a good man. Okay, okay. Right? But you get the idea. It was like very much in a group like this, Jesus called them out. Boom, why are you entertaining evil thoughts? Awkward. <laughs> which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? Okay, guys, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, right? That's easy to say. Like, I could even say that. I'm not going to because it's, you know. Not my business, but I, I, you know, I could say that. That's easy to say. But when you say get up and walk, oh, man, now you're putting it on the line, right? I mean, you say you get up and walk. Now, now if you're not something special, something unearthly of God, then the, guys, the paralyzed guys can just sit and look at you and go, okay, was this supposed to be a joke or something? Hello, paralyzed. Verse 6. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority, where? On earth, to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, get up, take your mat, and go home. And the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God, who had given such authority to men. What made these guys' faith great is they worked together. These guys worked together, and it was their faith that brought about the miracle. Sometimes you have a friend you're reaching out to. Maybe they're coming out to your small group, your Bible talk, or maybe they're a friend of a friend. Sometimes you got to work together. Amen. You know, I was really encouraged by the, by the campus guys working together to help Ian make the decision to be a disciple. He's going to get baptized here in a bit. It's awesome. I, I was really encouraged when, I, when Amy and I went to Albuquerque. This last week, I was really encouraged by the incredible job that Rob did preaching last week. That was awesome. And then, and then of course, to hear how the church ran really smoothly and everybody worked together, I was like, wow. It, without the maturity of you guys growing and maturing, Amy and I would not be able to go to support another church and oversee it. So it's a testimony to God working in your hearts to help the church be more mature so that Amy and I can go and help another church be healthy and strong and be encouraged. So without your help, we couldn't help them. And so I appreciate us being a, a, a church family and a movement of churches so we can work together. Their Women's Day was incredible, right? The 11 sisters there in that new church in Albuquerque had 35 in attendance total on, at their Women's Day. And Amy got to speak at a Women's Day. That was so exciting. Um, but I just see how working together, these when, when disciples of Jesus truly people trying to, to change lives. When they work together, they're so much more powerful. They're so much more powerful. And, 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 and when we work together in our small groups and with one another to really impact the people around us, we could bring more people to Jesus together. Amen? It wasn't like Lone Ranger Christianity. What makes faith great is sharing it. Amen? Let's go back to Matthew 9. You with me? Chapter, eight, chapter 9, verse 18. While Jesus was saying this, a ruler came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. 
Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her, take heart, daughter, he said, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. Then Jesus entered the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd. He said, go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. News of this spread throughout all that region. Jesus went from there. Two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he'd gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and, 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 they, and, and he asked them, Do you believe I, I'm, I'm, I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord, they, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, it will be done to you. And their sight was restored. Jesus warned them to certainly see that no one knows about this, but they went out and spread the news about him all over that region. Amen. <laughs> Probably would have been good if you're more grateful, guys, but amen. What made their faith great? Every single one of these people were unashamed, right? It was flat embarrassing to bank on Jesus that much. You say, this guy's going to raise my daughter from the dead, and all the people and relatives are mourning her, and they're playing the flutes, and they're like, celebrating the funeral and everything, and they laugh at you. It's like some desperate ploy of a desperate father to save the life of his child. This woman who'd been suffering for 12 years, what was she? Desperate. These blind men, what were they? Desperate. Sometimes to find your faith, you got to desperately look for it. Are you desperate this morning? If you're desperate, you can find your faith. But you got to go after it. Amen? I have a second point to close us out. Do not settle for a little faith. Look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. Then he got into the, la- into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. Are we getting a picture here, guys? Yeah. They're on a boat. Storm! waves crashing over the boat, and Jesus is brother taking a nap. I guess Jesus was a deep sleeper. Verse 25, the disciples went and woke up Jesus saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. Now, is that true? The boat is taking on water. It's a storm. Waves are coming into the boat. The answer to that question is, yes, if it keeps going on, they are going to, in fact, drown. It is a real dangerous situation to be in a storm and a boat in the middle. It's like they had scuba gear back then. They were really in danger. But the Bible says the disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Jesus replies here. I I, I think Jesus was like wiping his eyes up. When you just wake somebody up from a good nap, they're like, you know what I'm talking about like this? You know, that's kind of wet. What's, what's going on? It's kind of wet, okay. Huh. You have a little faith. Why are you so afraid? The issue wasn't the real situation, the real danger of drowning. The issue was their response to it and how they overlooked one huge factor. Jesus was with them. Then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. Imagine that, right? Jesus, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Quiet, be still. It's like the Lord hitting the snooze button, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Goes back to sleep. And people, they freak out. I think he laid back down personally. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I got another 20 minutes before we could get us out of the river or lake or whatever. You know, I don't know. But the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. What do they hope for? Not drowning. What do they not see? Safe passage. And what do they give into? Fear. This is a very logical response, guys, to this situation. When we look at a situation and base our response on what we see, we're going to end up being fearful and anxious. We've got to base our response on Jesus. Don't settle for a little faith. 
You know, I remember um, in 2016, my sister, my physical sister, had gotten into a, a, just in a bad way. And her and my mom weren't getting along at all. And her and my mom had an altercation. And I heard my sister's side of it. And it went a certain way. And I was like, I don't know if that's the whole picture. You know what I mean? You know, the Bible says you got to hear both sides before you make a judgment. So I'm like, let me call my mom, okay? So I call my mom. My mom's like, no, nah, that's not exactly how it would happen. That did happen, but that didn't happen. And this is kind of where it's at. And so because I sided with my mom, it really hurt my sister. You know? And then she kind of cut me off for a while. And uh, we had some, you know, a sharp exchange. I mean, she had a sharp exchange with me. And I was like, okay, okay. And uh, then she got really sick. We were really sick. And logically, the situation didn't look good. She had sepsis, which is like when your body gets a blood infection. And it's very dangerous and often can kill you. And it was so serious that she was in the ICU. And the doctors called my mom. My mom lives in Hawaii. And said, listen, your daughter may not make it till tomorrow. You need to get here because this might, this might be it. And so this is what's going on Friday night and Saturday morning while I'm in Albuquerque, and I'm trying to wrap my head around it, you know? I'm trying to explain to my kids why I'm a little emotional. I'm trying to, like, trying to process this, because I haven't talked to her in a couple years. And she used, to, she used to be a member of the church in 2011, 12, you know, um, but, but left, left that life and is living kind of her own life right now. And so it was just a real hard situation emotionally. And I'm talking to my cousin, who I never talked to, because, you know, it's interesting how grief and suffering will bring you together with people, you know. And uh, long story short, we don't know if she's going to make it. It's kind of touch and go. And um, for the first time, though, in, uh, in over three years, I finally got on the phone with my sister. I was really afraid to talk to her because of our last interaction, you know. And uh, my faith was low. I looked at the situation logically and then because I wasn't focused on Jesus, what could this could be, I felt fear, like these guys did. I saw the storm of the past of our interactions and thought, oh, that might happen again. But I believe because the brothers and sisters were praying for her in Seattle and here in Phoenix and in Albuquerque, something happened. Her heart was different. And miraculously, she recovered very quickly from the septus, and she got out of the ICU like the next day. And I got to tell my sister that I loved her. I'm so glad I got to do that because our last interaction was not godly. I got to remind her that she's special to me. And I'm so grateful for the church in Seattle. Like the parlors over there taking care of that ministry. They sent a couple of sisters to my, my sister's room who prayed with her, gave her a card, encouraged her, helped her out with her, with her infant. I mean, I love the kingdom. And God has opened a door, and now there's a relationship. Amen? I got one more for you. Amen, guys? Does that want us to have faith that moves mountains? And I want us to move mountains together. Let me ask you to look at Matthew 17, and we'll close out here. Matthew 17, verse 14. When they came, out, came to the crowd... A man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Uh-oh. Verse 17, Matthew 17. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed from that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? Jesus replied, because you have so little faith. I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Church, a mustard seed. Missions, just bring a mustard seed of faith. Every single one of us bearing fruit, 
Just bring a mustard seed of faith. Changing your character. Changing your eternal destiny. Mustard seed of faith. Restoring your honor. Restoring your integrity. A mustard seed of faith. Go after your faith. And let's move mountains together. Thank you for listening. Amen.